At this point, we're ready to take a detailed look at thermodynamics. We, I've been introducing these concepts as we go, so this chapter shouldn't be too rough, but let's formally talk about entropy, Gibbs free energy, and all the information that we can ascertain from those equations. Like I said, this is something that we talked about way back when we talked about solutions, but now let's formally do this. So when we take a look at thermodynamics, what is one of our main objectives in studying thermodynamics? So why do we even want to look at this? What information can we get? And the goal of this chapter is this. We want to predict whether or not a reaction is going to occur. And there it is. That's the whole goal of this chapter. Can, can we take a look at a reaction as it's written and using our information, looking at Gibbs free energy, looking at entropy, can we determine whether or not a reaction will occur or not? Okay. Now, what word, what word or phrase can we use to answer this question above? Well, it's spontaneous process. But this word, spontaneous, this is really going to be the, the key word of the chapter. If a reaction is spontaneous or not, it's going to occur on its own. I mean, that, that's all we want to know. Is a reaction spontaneous? Because if it is, the reaction will occur. All right, so let's define what this actually means. So to define what a spontaneous process is, that means that this is a process that occurs under a given set of conditions. Okay, but here's the kicker though. But given some sort of indication of speed. All right. Okay, so that that's the little that's a little hiccup here. You know, we're we're going to take a look at a reaction and then using our using our toolbox, we can try to figure out whether or not this is going to be spontaneous or not. But in order to figure out if it's spontaneous, we also have to take a look at kinetics just a little bit. And that's going to give us a little bit of more information or that's going to help us answer this overall question. Will the reaction occur or not? So what is, um, what is an example for a change that does occur? Well, gas expanding in a vacuum. That happens. There's no, I mean, it just happens. It doesn't, there's no energy change that, that's involved with that. It just happens. Okay. So that is definitely a spontaneous process. Okay. Now a change that doesn't occur, that doesn't occur spontaneously, gas contracting. All right. So here's our first question. What is the relationship between enthalpy, which is what we studied in the first, in, in Gen Chem 1, and spontaneous process. Now keep in mind that enthalpy, what we called this, uh, we called it back in Gen Chem 1 before we introduced that term enthalpy, we call that chemical energy. Okay, so what is the relationship between enthalpy and spontaneous processes? Well, here it is. So many exothermic reactions are spontaneous. Okay, but, and you knew that there was a but coming, wasn't it? But it's not necessarily true that all exothermic reactions are spontaneous. So while many exothermic reactions are spontaneous, it's not necessarily true that all are spontaneous.
Okay, so uh, when we're talking about exothermic reactions, let's take a look at the ones that we've studied. We've, we've taken a look at acid base. We've taken a look at precipitation. We've taken a look at combustion. Redox. And we've taken a look at a lot of different types of reactions. And so this is this is kind of the take home point. While many exothermic reactions are going to be spontaneous, meaning you have to supply just enough heat to get the reaction going and it's going to go on its own. Not all exothermic reactions will be spontaneous. OK, so what are what's the experimental evidence for this last conclusion? OK, so why? Why can we make this generalization? Well, keep in mind that some endothermic reactions will also be spontaneous. Like, for instance, if we take a solid, if we take water, a solid water, so ice, and that becomes liquid water, the enthalpy for that reaction is about six kilojoules per mole. All right. Now, if the temperature is greater than zero degrees Celsius, absolutely. This is an endothermic process, so it's going to absorb heat. But we also know that this process is going to happen. It's going to be it's going to be spontaneous. All right. Now. What two things do we need to know to determine spontaneity? Well, one of them we've already talked about. We need to know enthalpy. Okay. The other term we've, we've kind of hinted around, and I've introduced this before, is delta S. And we call it delta S entropy. Okay. So let's define this. Entropy is defined as a measure of randomness in a system. Okay. And in order to, re I mean, we've, we talked about, you know, that definition before back in chapter 13. So now what I want to do is kind of explore entropy from a different perspective. So there is actually a, a field of thermodynamics, the, the science that we're studying right now, that actually tries to relate uh, the physical view, your physical world with the world of molecules. Okay, and this is called statistical thermodynamics. And so one of the cool things that we can do in, in thermodynamics is apply statistics to this. Okay, so what we're gonna do is start, is trying to look at this, look at entropy from a different perspective. Let's take a look at this in, in terms of statistics. Okay, so in order to, to do that, I've got to introduce something called a microstate. Okay, so what I want to do is take a look at this picture and try to figure out what information we can ascertain from this. So let's say you've got a box. Okay, and I'm going to draw the box over here on the right hand side. All right, inside this box, you're going to have four balls. And each ball, it has a label. So you got one, two, three, and four. Okay. Now, inside this box, you also have a partition. You have a wall between the two sides. So you make two sides. So I want to know, with the, the setup that we've got, We've got this box that has this partition in the side. We've got these four balls. They're labeled one, two, three, and four. I want to know what are the chances or what are the, how many different setups or how many different microsystems are possible using this setup. All right, so let, let's take a look at this. So the first distribution is, let's say you've got, okay, your first setup. You've got all four balls on one side of this box, and then you've got nothing on that on, on the other side. Okay. Is there another way that we could draw this? Yes, we could put all four balls in the same on the, the opposite side, and then we have no balls on the opposite end. Okay. So 
that there's really but that even though there's another way of drawing that taking all four balls and putting them over here that still is going to give you the same microstate you have all four balls on one side okay so that being said for this setup you have four balls on one side to zero balls on the other side and so there's really only one way of setting that up Okay, even if you put the balls on the opposite end, you're still going to have the same, you're still going to have that same ratio, four to zero. Now, for the second setup, what I'm going to do is say, let's say we're going to put one ball on the right hand side, three balls on the left hand side. So, what we're doing now is just changing on the right hand side which ball stays on the right. So, in the box in the first, in the upper left-hand corner, we have ball four. If we go to the upper right-hand corner, we have ball three. Lower left-hand corner, we have ball two. And then lower right-hand corner, you have ball one. So we have four. Each ball is going to be on its own on the right-hand side. And now you're going to have three balls on the left-hand side. So how many different ways could we draw this? Well, you got four different ways of drawing this because you have four different balls. So that ratio was three balls on the left, one ball on the right, okay? And there are four different ways of drawing this. All right, now what if I have two balls on the left and two balls on the right? With that setup, and what we're looking at here, so it, we could have balls one and two on the left. You could have balls three and four on the right. You could have balls three and four on the left, balls one and two on the right. So this ends up being that you could draw this six different ways. So you have two, two balls on the left, two balls on the right. Okay. Now, you might be asking this question. Wait a minute. Balls one and two on the left and balls three and four on the right that's the same as what you're seeing right here on the, you know, going to the next where you have balls three and four on the left, balls one and two on the right. True. True. It's just the mirror image of what you got. But because you have balls, the, the, num the balls are differently numbered, that those balls represent different molecules or different phases. So... We don't necessarily, I mean, there, there's a different microstate, microstate. So, all right, so think of it this way. How many different microstates did we have together? So you had one way plus four ways, so that gives you five different ways plus six ways. So if we add all this up, you have 11 different ways of drawing this. Or if we want to say it different way, in a different sense, 11 different microstates. Okay. Now, out of the three, out of the three distributions, Roman numeral one, Roman numeral two, and Roman numeral three, which state is the more probable? Well, taking a look at this, which state has the most microstates? And it's going to be number three. Number three is the most probable. where you have two balls on one side, two balls on the other side, and it's the more probable one because there's more microstates than the other. So which one is least probable? Stage one, where you have all four balls on one side and none on the other. All right, so what can we say as the number of molecules approaches the macroscopic? So what can we say, all right? So what we can say is this, that equal distribution between the two components is most probable. Okay, so that means looking at Roman numeral three. And that also means that Roman numeral one, where you have four balls on one side and zero on the other, is very unlikely to occur. Oh, 
Okay, so now that we've got a little bit set more sense of what's going on in the randomness, now let's take a look at entropy from a little bit more of a mathematical point of view. There is an equation that we can use to calculate, to calculate entropy. And this was actually derived by Ludwig Boltzmann in the 1860s. And he said this, that entropy, delta, uh, entropy on its own, so S, is going to be equal to K times the natural log of W. Now, we got a lot of letters here. So let's, let's go through this. So S, we know, is entropy. Okay. And entropy, that's the amount of randomness in the system. K is referred to as Boltzmann's constant. Now, Boltzmann, the reason why I'm going to stop here and explain this a little bit, Ludwig Boltzmann worked on, looked at, at the distribution of molecules in a system. And he was actually the one that tried to figure out, you know, that that took a look at a curve and saw that, you know, you, at a certain temperature, you're going to have like a ton of molecules that are going to have, you know, these energies, these speeds. And then as you decrease the temperatures, you're going to you're going to have less amount of molecules on this end. OK, now. So so that's where this K is coming from, from this Boltzmann's distribution. OK. If you go on to PCAM and take a look at this, you'll, you'll use this a lot more. W. W is known as the number of microstates. All right. Now, there is a little bit of a problem with this, though, with, with the way that we're defining entropy. And the, the problem is this. We know, if you guys remember back in Gen Chem 1, or if you guys remember back in Chapter 3, uh, chapter 13, entropy is a state function. So that means we can't measure entropy directly. We have a pretty, we can measure the deltas, and that's pretty good, but we can't get the entropy for a certain system at a certain point in time because it's, it's really hard to define that. So we could measure this. If we define this in terms of change in entropy, delta S, that would be the final entropy minus the initial entropy, okay? Or if I'm going to re let's rewrite this in terms of the, um, if we re rewrite this in terms of our equation, K equals, uh, S equal K times natural log of W, that would be equal to K times the natural log of the microstates at the final minus K times natural log of W initially. Okay. And so I can simplify this a little bit more. If I combine the equations and, and simplify this, this would be equal to K times the natural log of the final number of microstates divided by the initial number of microstates. And so we can change this equation and make it see, you know, make it make it take on that form that we had previously. We can't measure entropy directly. It's hard to pinpoint that at a certain point in time, but we can measure the change in a system. All right, so instead of using our balls in, in one box, let's take a look at this from a little bit more of a molecular approach. Okay, so let's say you've got a solid, okay, and we melt that solid, we provide heat, and we transform that solid to a liquid, okay? We know because that we're breaking up the orderness of the solid and it becomes a liquid, we break up that order, it becomes more disruptive. The structure is disrupted, so that means that the entropy has to be increasing because the system's more random. Okay, so what this means in terms of microstates is that when we disrupt a solid and it becomes a liquid, not only are we increasing the entropy, but we're also increasing the number of microstates. So the more microstates you have, the more microstates you have, 
that means the entropy has got to be increasing. So if we take a look at a liquid and a liquid becomes a vapor, if we provide that the amount of heat that we need to do that, same deal here. We're breaking up the structure. We're making this more random. We're increasing the number of microstates. So the entropy has got to increase. Same thing here. If we take a solution, if we, if we have a solute, we've got a solvent, we mix the two up and we make a solution. You're increasing the randomness. You're increasing the number of microstates. So you're increasing the entropy. And then finally, if we take a system that's at a certain temperature and we raise the temperature, we, in, we increase the number of microstates, we increase the randomness. Okay, so what we're looking at here is that the products in this picture become more random. So that means you have more molecular randomness. All right. So as an example, as an example, the melting of a solid produces more possible microstates for the atoms, hence an increase in entropy. Which process will have a larger increase in entropy? Will it be vaporizing or will it be melting? And so the answer to that, vaporizing. Vaporizing will be larger over melting. And why is that? Well, keep in mind that the number of microstates increases that means the entropy has got to be increasing. What can we say about the change in entropy for dissolution? Generally Mixing increases entropy. Okay, so we need to explain this too. So let's try to explain this. The solid structure is disrupted. The liquid structure is also disrupted. Okay, and therefore the combination of the solid and liquid has more possible microstates. Okay, now when temperatures increases, when temperatures increase, what change in molecules affect their entropy? So when the temperature increases, you're going to have more motions. And that means you're going to have translational, vibrational, rotations. And so what that means, the more motions means more possible microstates. So that means as the temperature increases, the entropy also increases as well. All right, so in this, what we've done in this video is try to take a look at entropy from a couple different perspectives. Hopefully entropy makes a little bit more sense. What we're going to do next is take a look at entropy and try to figure out, try to define what standard entropy is. And what that does is sets us up to talk about how is equilibrium related to all of this.